Hernán Cortés and the Aztecs who were ruled by Moctezuma II. Hopefully you've already studied the Aztecs, Moctezuma, Tenochtitlan, the social structure and religion of the Aztecs and the empire that they built in Mesoamerica, Central America. But now we're going to talk about the Spaniards who came and rammed into Aztec society in 1519 and in the end conquer it and basically destroy it. And so this is the story in some ways of uh, particularly a guy named Hernán Cortés, but it's also a story of Spanish conquistadors in general. And conquistadors were conquerors, literally, uh, kind of this mix of soldiers and private adventurers who came to the Americas. Uh, and theoretically, they came to the Americas for three reasons, God, gold, and glory, and not necessarily in that order. The God part was that they were supposed to convert the Indians to Catholicism, and they did that when they had enough time, but honestly it was pretty low on their uh, list of things to do. They came for glory. A lot of these guys were poor people from a very poor part of Spain called Extremadura, and they came to the New World to make it, basically. Um, you wouldn't risk that dangerous journey without some big rewards at the end, and glory was one of those things. But probably what they really cared about was gold, the money. Uh, you knew after a while that if you came to the Americas, you could get very, very rich. And so that's what the conquistadors were all about. When Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, uh, one of the things that is surprising about that was that he didn't really find anything in the Caribbean where he first went. I mean, nothing that from the Spanish point of view really mattered. They found fairly poor from Spanish point of view, uh, Native American groups, particularly the Arawaks on the uh, islands of the Caribbean, who they proceeded to basically exterminate through a mix of disease and rape and brutality uh, and enslavement and things like that. And not a lot else. Those islands were good for agriculture, but they weren't really the kinds of agricultures that the Spanish cared about. And they didn't yet realize that they grow a lot of sugar there and get rich. So the Caribbean islands at first were just a staging place for the Spaniards, Spanish conquistadors. Uh, and the biggest island in the Caribbean, Cuba, became kind of the base for uh, the Spaniards before they came to the Americas. And so from 1492 to 1519, which is when Cortez is going to go to Mexico, um, you had this period of about 27 years or whatever, where the Europeans were just building up supplies, um, because getting things to the Americas was very tricky. You had these tiny little Spanish galleons, which were, you know, small, small, unbelievably small from our point of view. And, you know, you had to sail six to eight weeks across the Atlantic drop off whatever you had there, and then come all the way back. So it was very difficult to build up supplies in the Americas, and that's crucial for this story. Um, getting even any horses to the Americas, where they did not exist, was incredibly tricky. If you can imagine sailing a horse across the ocean um, in an old sailing ship, getting cannons across, gunpowders across, uh, enough men to actually conquer the Aztecs took a very long time. And that kind of affects the story of how Cortez and the Aztecs interact, because Cortez is actually taking advantage of this huge percentage of the entire Spanish force that was in the Americas. Um, and Spain, by the time Cortes does his thing, is beginning to wonder, like, was this a good investment to do all this work to get into these islands when they weren't really the Indies? I mean, they had not found Asia. They now knew that. And they were wondering if they'd found anything worth anything at all. And the Aztecs proved that they had. Before Cortes set sail in 1519, there had actually been two previous explorations to the American mainland. Uh, the first one was by uh, Bernal Diaz del Castillo, uh, who had come uh, from Cuba and had sailed to the basically closest part of Mexico to Cuba, the Yucatan Peninsula, and he had proceeded to be ambushed, he lost a ton of his men, uh, he barely made it out of there alive. The only thing that uh, Diaz did discover was that the natives on the mainland of the Americas had basically the same technology as the people on uh, the Caribbean islands, which was good news for the Spanish. Uh, there were no guns, there was no gunpowder, there were no horses. So basically, even 
though Diaz's trip was a failure, it did point out that there was a similar technological gap between the Spaniards and whoever was living on the mainland of the Americas. And they had also found a bigger piece of land than these little islands that definitely seemed like something more substantial. The next person to try uh, to get to the American mainland was uh, Juan de Grajalva, who came in 1518, the year after Diaz did it. And Grajalva was very careful because uh, Diaz had had such a bad experience. So he had just kind of sailed uh, the coast from the Yucatan up uh, basically the southern Mexican coast, exploring, looking for water sources, which had been one of Diaz's problems, and generally trying to negotiate his way through the region and figure out what was going on. And while Grajalva was doing that, he was constantly being told stories, usually through something like, you know, sign language and stuff like that, and small trade chain. Uh, trading of gifts, that there was this very rich, powerful group of people to the north. And probably the locals were just telling Grijalva, like, there's a lot of money up there, please go away. Um, but the net result was that the Spanish had, you know, saucer eyes of like, there's money out there and we can go get it. Um, these two years were also kind of crucial because they gave the Spaniards the possibility of learning the Mayan language. So there were a couple of Spaniards who had managed to learn a significant amount of the Mayan language, which is going to be crucial if you're actually going to interact with another culture to actually know how to speak. The problem, of course, is the Aztecs don't speak Mayan, they speak Nahua, and so there was still a piece to the puzzle missing. But those two trips before uh, Cortes leaves are a big part of the story in setting Cortes up for later victory. So one of the key things about this event and this series of events is that Hernán Cortés, the guy who will conquer the Aztecs and for a while possibly be the richest person on the planet and the biggest landowner on the planet uh, because he effectively becomes king of the Aztecs for reasons you'll learn later, uh, Cortés was not the first guy to come to the Americas. Uh, he wasn't necessarily the first choice even of the governor Velázquez of Cuba to do this sort of thing. Um, and Cortes was 33 by this point, which was a fairly old age for a conquistador. Um, he'd been in the Americas for a long time and he kind of hadn't made it. So he was a pretty hungry guy. Um, and he was also a guy who kind of knew like this was his shot and he probably wasn't gonna get another good one uh, when he does it. Um, and so that makes it kind of important when Cortes does head off for the coast, he can rely on the information that Diaz and Grajalva had already provided him and because there was a knowledge that there was something there to find, uh, Cortes is allowed to take a very large chunk of uh, the resources in Spanish Caribbean to the mainland. Uh, in particular, he brings about 600 men, uh, Spaniards, and then also some Arawak Indians who are probably porters and basically slaves. There were also some actual slaves uh, from Africa who were being brought to the to the coast as well. Um, and then he also had, very importantly, gunpowder weapons and 17 horses, which would actually be the first horses ever to exist in North America. And so Cortez, when he does sail to the Mexican coast, is carrying an enormous amount of pressure and, uh, you know, an enormous percentage of Spanish force. So he is set and he is supposed to be careful, which is key to the story. Uh, Governor Velasquez was determined not to lose all of this stuff, and Velasquez himself wanted to be the guy to conquer whatever was there and to find it, and so he had ordered Cortez to be very careful, don't go anywhere, just visit this rich people, set up a fort, set up some trade relationship, some negotiating relationship, learn the local language if you have to, but just basically sit on the coast, stay there, and set up trade. And Cortez is not going to do that. The king of the Aztecs at this time, who Cortes is going to run into, is named Moctezuma II. Um, he was, at this point, 40 years old. He'd been ruling for 17 years, and he was situated in Tenochtitlan, which is about 200 or so miles up uh, into the central Mexican highlands in, South, in central Mexico, modern-day Mexico City. Um, so he's very distant from the coast, um, and that's going to change things because he can't easily communicate with the people on the coast. And remember, the Aztecs have no horses, no speedy transportation, there's no radio, no TV, no internet, obviously. So anything he hears is going to be a week late and 
and translated through various porters. I mean, not still all in Nawa, his own language, but um, it won't. It'll be like this weird game of telephone where he doesn't actually know what's going on on the coast. Furthermore, there had been a whole series of strange rumors, which you know probably always exist in cultures. There's always strange rumors, but after the fact, those strange rumors become very important. Um, and some of the strange rumors that supposedly were going around was that uh, fishermen had found a fish with like a mirror on its head. I've never really gotten that one. Um, and there were various other things. A, a woman who was wandering around uh, moaning and saying that people were going to lose their children and things like that, possibly connected to the La Llorona myth, um, and various other kind of bad omens that had existed. Um, so when Cortez does show up, Moctezuma is you know, kind of late middle aged for an Aztec king. He's a little bit spooked. And then he starts hearing these very strange stories from the coast that he probably couldn't have really registered. And one of the crucial possible impacts of this whole thing was that one of the Aztec gods, not Huitzilopochtli, um, but Quetzalcoatl, was reminiscent in some ways of some of the characteristics of Cortez. Uh, white skin for, for Quetzalcoatl. Uh, he was supposedly a winged serpent god. And if you think about the, the sails on the ship, there's possibly some connections there. So there's a possibility that the very religious Aztecs were spooked enough by all kinds of rumors and then the actual appearance of the Spanish uh, that kind of jived with various things that they might have already understood that Moctezuma was not in a good position to figure out like what was happening there on the coast and how he should deal with it. So Cortez sails with his supplies and his men and his horses and his guns and he gets to the coast of Mexico, basically modern-day Veracruz, um, sets up a little fort, what's called a stockade, around a water source, and basically settles down to try and figure out what's going on. Um, he wants to make sure he's got good water supplies, he wants to make sure he has a protected base, um, and he's trying to figure out what's happening there. So while he's there, of course, he immediately realizes that this is a very much richer society than the other stuff they run into. Uh, the Aztecs are clearly quite powerful and quite wealthy. Um, and in fact, one of the crucial events that happens for Cortez for this entire experience is that as part of the attempt to kind of buy off his, uh, you know, threat, uh, the Aztecs proceed to give him a significant number of gifts early on, particularly once Moctezuma does realize that he is on the coast. Uh, Moctezuma begins to sort of try, try and bribe Cortez to go away, uh, which unfortunately has the exact opposite impact, because once you show the Spaniards that you have gold, they're going to want it. Um, but a crucial event that happens in this gift-giving process, as Cortez and his men are kind of settling in, they're also getting really sick, uh, but then they're having time to like get better from the local diseases and things like that is that Cortez is given 20 slaves uh, by the locals, um, uh, Aztec people, or actually people who the Aztecs had conquered and made part of the empire. Um, but they are given, Cortez is given 20 slaves um, who are locals. And amongst those slaves is a woman, a young woman, somewhere between the ages of, I don't know, 17 and 25, um, whose name is Malinche, probably, uh, could also be Malincen. Uh, when she converts to Catholicism, uh, she will be called Doña Marina. Um, but Malinche is given to Cortez. Um, and a lot of these slaves were female. They were uh, taken advantage of sexually because this was a very brutal time uh, in terms of gender relationships. And Malinche ends up being passed, I think, first to Cortez's brother or cousin, I don't remember, but eventually she ends up with Cortez um, within the first few weeks. Um, and she is super crucial for this event. This, like, teenage girl or very young 20s girl turns out to be kind of the key to the puzzle in some ways for Cortez. And, and in some ways, you kind of have to wonder if Cortez could have succeeded without Malinche. Um, Malinche is uh, fluent in Nahua, the language of the Aztecs. Um, and she's also fluent in Mayan. And if you remember from earlier on, uh, there are Spaniards who speak a decent amount of Mayan. So between them, Cortez can now speak uh, to his Spaniard people who speak Mayan. They speak to Malinche. She then can translate directly to the Aztecs. So they have very quickly a direct form of pretty accurate communication, which helps Cortez a great deal. Um, the other part about this that is crucial for Cortez is that because Malinche is translating um, and sleeping with him, he trusts his translator. 
Um, and that is a crucial, crucial element. She also is apparently an extremely intelligent person, one of these people who just like picks up languages like that. Um, so very quickly she learns to speak Spanish, which, you know, if you're sleeping with your Spanish teacher, which is not a good idea, um, you will learn the language pretty quickly. Um, and so Malinche becomes very quickly for Cortez this enormous uh, resource where he can talk unlike any other Spanish person directly to the Aztecs. Um, and Malinche also seems to have been a, uh, a kind of slave slash captive who had been sold off by her family possibly or possibly kidnapped. Her history is very vague and a lot of these stories are buried later on by the Spaniards and of course the Aztecs aren't around to tell the stories. Um, but one way or another she seems to have been either partially noble or at least connected enough to actually understand a little bit of local politics and be able to tell Cortez what was going on. So for instance, he could tell her or she could tell him that uh, there were lots of local people who the Aztecs had conquered and who had to pay tribute to the Aztecs who uh, might be willing to side with Cortez against the Aztecs. That would have been an incredibly useful piece of information for Cortez to uh, receive and um, and this also, this ability to speak really directly is very helpful for Cortez. It also begins to spook his men because they are watching Cortez and this young girl um, sort of become the only communicators between them and the Aztecs. Um, and obviously it would be a little strange for everybody involved at this time who was male, the Spaniards, the Aztecs, anybody around who are not used to taking women seriously at all to have, you know, this 18 to 25 year old woman at the center of these debates and in the room, which would be very unusual at the time for any case. Um, and so Cortez and Malinche end up really kind of setting this whole stage up for the later conquest, putting Cortez in a situation where he knows what's going on with the Aztecs and they don't know what's going on with him. So Malinche is crucial for Cortez and for this story in many ways. End of part one of the lecture, Cortez and the Aztecs.